Father, we come to you here for this midweek service. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to worship you. We pray, Lord, that this nation might turn from her wickedness and, and repent and realize that they need to turn to your son, Jesus, and that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And Father, we just pray that we'll continue to support Israel and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and that Israel will be able to quickly defeat her enemies and and uh, the Israelis will wake up too to, to realize that their Messiah has already come, that, that Jesus is coming again, and that uh, he's coming soon. And so, Father, as we have our study this morning on, continue our study on Daniel, we, we pray, Lord, that you'll give your servant the words to speak and to uh, have the proper understanding, teach the people. And and Father, we know that the events that we're learning here and in Revelation, that they're soon to happen. And so, Father, we just pray that people be prepared so they don't have to go through the tribulation and spend eternity in hell. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless this service. Be with all those that are out there making a stand and preaching your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study in Daniel. This will be Daniel part 49. And we're looking at Chap been looking at chapter 7, and <clears throat> in this chapter, then, this was at the beginning in the first year of Belshazzar, who was the king of Babylon. We had gone back into Babylon, you know, we had been in uh, the Medo-Persian Empire, or Darius, but now we're back into Babylon. And Daniel has this dream, you know, has a vision by night, says in chapter 7, verse 2. And then he, when he w woke up, he writes down this vision you know it says there in verse 2 that that um, behold the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea and he sees these four beasts that come up out of the sea each one's uh, diverse from the other one it means they're all different from each other and he describes these four be four beasts you know the first one was like a lion that had eagle's wings and we said that this one here it was describing the uh, Medo-Persian Empire, and um, I mean, sorry, the uh, Babylonian Empire, and that, um, you know, that each one of these beasts we're going to see is going to describe an empire, and the, the first one here is the Babylonian Empire. Then, the second one, it says in uh, verse 5 that he saw another beast that it was like a bear, and it had, had three ribs in its mouth, and, and it was on one side. And we said that described the uh, Medo-Persian Empire, which was, you know, made up of two empires, the Medes and the Persians. And, you know, one side was stronger than the other. Originally it was the Medes, and then eventually became the Persians. You know, remember, Persia today is Iran. Then the third um, one he saw was, was described like a leopard, that had wings on its four wings on its back like a fowl, and it had four heads. And it, we described this one as it was the the Greek Empire, where it was ruled under Alexander the Great, and then at his death, then it was divided up among his four generals. There are four heads. Then he describes a fourth beast in verse seven, and this one is described as being dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and had great iron teeth. It says it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, we said that this fourth beast is the Roman Empire, but it's actually, we're going to see that it's actually a two-part thing. It was the original Roman Empire that defeated the Greeks there. That was the Roman Empire that was ruling at the time of when Jesus was walking here on earth. But then Rome collapsed and, you know, self-destructed itself and collapsed. But it's going to be revived in the end times here for the tribulation. And that's where you're going to see, you know, but it was known it was the strength of, of Rome was the iron. That's the iron there. But it, then it has ten horns, which we're going to see that, that, that the horns were, uh, the, the ten kings are going to serve under the Antichrist during the tribulation. That horns represent, in scripture, they represent power. You know, there, there are kings and so forth like that, that, that uh, you know, these, these horns, when you see them, you know, we, we saw that there in Revelation 
uh, 13, 1, we saw that last week where John says that he stood upon, says, and I, the, the, John speaking here, and he says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. You know, he's describing the Antichrist. You know, the Antichrist has, you know, the, the, the ten horns, and it says upon his horns ten crowns. So again, we also know that, that um, you know, we're talking about kings and so forth here. But we're, I said we're going to see that this fourth beast is different because it's just, it's part spiritual and not, you know, all these other ones. If you notice that this fourth beast, as I said last week, it's not described as being an animal. All the other ones, you know, you had the lion, the bear, and a leopard. This one here is not described as any kind of animal because there is no animal that can really fit its description because this this especially the, the revived empire, it's going to be more of a spiritual one. I mean, it's going to be real, but it's going to be, the spiritual world is going to be very much involved. You know, during the tribulation, it's not going to be so hidden like it is now. You know, there's angels, good and bad around us all the time, and the spiritual world, they're always, they're always there. But during the tribulation, some of this stuff, it's not going to be so hidden anymore. You know, it's not going to be invisible, and, and you know, it's going to be a lot more relevant. You know, the Antichrist himself is going to be indwelt by Satan from the midpoint on. So, you know, we we're, that's why it's, it's really, you know, uh, a special notice there. But let's go ahead and take a look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. This is Daniel speaking here. and says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. So Daniel considers or thinks about what the ten horns are that he saw on this fourth beast. As Daniel was doing so, then there came up another little horn. Now this is an eleventh horn. You know, you had the ten horns, but another little horn comes up. So there's it's really eleven horns here. Now this little horn plucks up three of the ten horns by their roots, showing they are destroyed. So he says here, it says, And behold, there came up among them another little horn. So, you know, I didn't say one of the horns. He says another little horn. So, you know, there, there, it's an eleventh horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So, you know, he when you pluck up something by its roots, you know, you're destroying it. You know, you're trying to get a weed out. You know, you make sure you get the roots out, or you want to get rid of a tree or something. You get rid of the roots because that's what kills it, you know, destroys it. You know, you're eliminating it. So this 11th little horn pulls up three of these um, of those 10 horns. As I said, you pull something up by its roots, then it is dead and will not come back. You know, that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to destroy three of these kings. He's going to get rid of them. Now, Daniel describes this little horn as having the eyes of a man, a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, this little horn is the Antichrist, who is described as little, I believe, because he will subtly take control, I believe, by his charm and speech and deceive the people. You know, if you notice, if we are studying Revelation, then the, the first um, judgment or whatever, then of the seal judgments, you know, it's the Antichrist. He's being released on the world. And it says he comes in peace. You know, of course, it's a false peace, you know, because shortly after that, you're going to have the second uh, seal judgment where he's got the war. You know, so he, he comes as this false peace. I'm going to bring peace to everybody. You know, everybody wants peace in this world. You know, oh, we need to do something about Israel. Oh, we need to do something about, you know, this situation going on here, you know, with Ukraine or wherever maybe. You know, everybody always, we got to have peace. So they'll do anything to have peace, you know, that, uh, you know, people have often said, you know, they'll even accept the Antichrist himself or the one world leader. If it means we'll have peace, well, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're, when the, the real Antichrist comes, you know, we have Antichrist now, but when the Antichrist comes, then that's what they're going to do. You know, Israel itself is going to make peace. If they have that seven-year treaty that they make, which starts the tribulation, which is going to get broken at the midpoint. But you know, everybody's trying to to have this peace, and so, and I think you know that's way he was. You know, Hitler when he first took over, he do all these. You know, he would 
say, you know, the right things. You know, he had this voice. And of course, you know, when it's being controlled by the satanic world too, then, then it, uh, you know, people, some people, you know, rock and roll singers or certain ones, they can mesmerize people. They just like to hear the voices and everybody's like, whoa, you know, and they, they kind of, they hear that. And, and so, you know, probably going to have like devil speaking through them and stuff too. But, but he, he says what the people want to hear, you know, Satan knows what people want. So they, 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 they he's going to say what, what they want to hear. And he's going to be one of those people that, you, you know, people are always looking like, Oh, this, this guy here, the presence, the, the Antichrist or this person. No, I think it's going to be somebody that just comes out of the woodwork. You know, it's kind of like Obama, you know, he was nobody. Next thing you know, the guy's president that, that, um, you know, it's going to be, and I'm not saying he's the Antichrist because he's not going to be the Antichrist. He's an Antichrist, but he's not the Antichrist. But the, um, it'll be somebody like that that, you know, that comes out of nowhere. Or even like this Zelensky. Nobody heard a thing about this guy. And now everybody thinks it's like, oh, hell, it's Zelensky. What can we give you? You know, let's just give you the whole world. You know, and so it's, um, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I think that's how he's going to trick him. You know, like I said, Hitler, he did that. He smooth talked everybody, you know, and then later on he started conquering places. But initially it wasn't done that way. You know, Austria gave in, you know, without a fight. They just said, hey, they asked, hey, we want to join with you because, you know, you're one of us. And, and um, you know, of course, Hitler promised him all these different things and stuff like that. But, you know, and I think that the Antichrist would be the same way. You know, it's like politicians. They promise all this stuff. So everybody votes for him. But then once they get in, then, then, you know, that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to deceive everybody. He's going to get rid of three of these. Once he, his power gets in, set in place, he's going to get rid of three of these horns and, and so forth. As I said, Revelation shows he will come initially pretend to bring peace. And then once in power, he will bring war and start to show his true self. You know, that's what all dictators do. They always do these things. And, um, you know, once they get things kind of settled once they really get in power. And number one, they start trying to get rid of all the people that are around them that know all about them. They get rid of them, but then their true self comes out and that's when then they, the wars really start and that type of stuff. So, you know, that's exactly what the Antichrist can do. As I said, at first he is little, but once in power, he gets rid of three of the horns or kings to try and control the world. You know, eventually he wants to, to completely rule. But even any decent ruler, you should always have, to a point, some sub-kings or whatever you want to say. That's why he still leaves seven of them. Because, you know, one person cannot, you know, he's going to have a little more influence because he's going to have devils helping him and so forth. But, it, um, you know, as a person here, I cannot be all over the world at the same time. So I need to have people like, okay, here, you take the European section, you know, you take Africa, you know, you take, you know, Asia or whatever, South America or something like that. And, you know, you kind of help me out, you know, you assist me. Okay, what's going on? You know, it's kind of like what Satan does. You know, he has all these angels underneath him and they inform him because Satan's the same way. He cannot be everywhere at once. He's not God. So he has to have the devils and they say, yeah, hey, this is what's going on over here. Right, you know, all right, let's do this then or something, you know. So, you know, even though you want to be in control, you still have to have some assistance or whatever you want to say. So. You know, he has these people that are underneath him and probably three of them he could tell were not quite so loyal. You know, the thing is, there's a lot of people. That's one reason why everybody hates Putin is because, you know, the whole world hates him and wants to go after Ukraine because it's not they care about Ukraine. They never care one I owe about him until, you know, the invasion. But it's because Putin wants to ruin the world from her perspective. You know, everybody wants to be the, the one world leader. Well, Putin wants to do it under Russia. Others want to do it, you know, in a different way. And that's why they're against him. And so... You know, these three kings that get disposed, you know, it's probably the same way. They probably, you know, find it out, well, hey, I got this power. Because a lot of them, they find out once you get a little power, like, hey, I kind of like this. I want to move up. Why should I let the Antichrist, you know, I helped him out. But, hey, let's get rid of him or let's, you know, I want to move up myself. So, you know, that's why they're going to, you know, people rebel. You see that in Revelation even later on with the kings of the East and so forth. But. But I, as I said, I believe he will gain this power quickly. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things, you know, number one, the tribulation only lasts seven years. So you can't, you can't mess around too long. But people, you know, you look at when uh, we had the pandemic going on, then people, uh, you know, I mean, even the Pope had said that, oh, we need a one world leader to get us through this crisis. 
Excuse me. And I think that's what, you know, I wouldn't be surprised and go, that's why they want to always have something going on because they use that as an excuse. Oh, see, we got, you know, they got this, this going on. You know, there's, there's a, a, a pandemic or we have, you know, wars everywhere, or, you know, whatever it is, you know, they come up with something so that, you know, see, we need to have somebody because, you know, or, you know, there's all this nonsense on the global warming stuff and things like, oh, well, see, we need to have somebody that can control the whole world. And so, you know, people will, will easily, you know, fall for this man. And then, like I said, I think with his smooth talking, he'll quickly come. And, you know, they'll be looking for somebody because, like I said, I don't think he's going to be somebody that you hear about now. Like, you know, I'm sure he's around, but I don't think he's necessarily like, oh, he's the president of, of uh, you know, some country or he's the leader of somebody. He's not, he's not some big politician, I don't think, now. Or I don't think he's something that, you know, he's just all of a sudden going to appear on the scene, so to speak. And so... It's, um, you know, you're going to be like, where'd this guy come from? Now, notice how the little horn or antichrist plucks three horns, which are similar to the bear with three ribs in its mouth, which we already said was kingdoms. And so it is the three horns here. Remember, if you go back to verse um, six, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, five. Verse 5, it says, And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth, teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And, you know, and we said that <clears throat> there's different opinions, but most believe that those three ribs are describing um, various empires, you know, or, or uh kingdoms or whatever that the Medo Persians destroyed in order to gain power. You know, basically the Syrians, the Babylonians, and uh, you know, just that that's you know what they how they came into power. And basically that's what's happening here is he has he takes out three of them, but in this case it's the horns. But as we said, we know that the horns represent uh, three kings. And Revelation tells us that. So it's not one of those things or you know we're gonna see that later on. The scripture tells us that. So it's not one of those things, oh, that's just your opinion. No, scripture tells us that the that the horns represent kingdoms. So the kings. You know, it tells us that the ten horns is ten kings. Now, the eyes of man shows this little horn is a man and not a kingdom. You know, so we know that. The, the horns itself are kings. Like I said, it tells us later on in Scripture that the ten horns are ten kings. But we, so, but, so obviously, then the little horn should be one as well. You know, and, I, and as I said, being a little horn, it's, it's obviously it's not some big superpower. You know, the United States or you know America or you know Russia or somebody like that. You know, China. You know, you think of the, the so-called bigger powers today. It's not going to be somebody like that. It's some little horn. You know, it's somebody that, that he's just comes out of nowhere. But it says, a mouth that speaks great things has a dual meaning. Now, the Antichrist will blaspheme God, but will also speak the things that people want to hear. You know, and I think that's exactly it. You know, Hitler always said what the people wanted to hear. You know, that's what a lot of your, your great leaders do. You know, Obama even, you know, I, I can't stand a guy. But, you know, that he was kind of that way in that sense, like the Antichrist, because he's a type of the Antichrist, that... Um, you know, he would say, well, I'm going to bring change. But he never say what the change was. Well, I'm just going to bring change. Every president brings change, good or bad. And But yet he was uh, going to do all these things. And, you know, they say what the people want to hear. You know, some of your, your false preachers do it. You know, Joel Osteen, he's one of them. You know, he says what everybody wants to hear. Oh, if you do this, you're going to become rich. And this and that, you know, the prosperity gospel and all that. You know, that's not what scripture says. It's, it says the more you serve the Lord, the more you're going to suffer. And so... You know, he's going to say what the people want to hear. You know, people don't go, want to go to church and have a pastor telling them, oh, that you're a sinner and, and that you need to be saved or that you need to do this or that. You know, people just want to hear all the feel-good stuff. That's why a lot of these bigger churches, you know, I'm not saying every one of them, but the vast majority of these large churches, they're not very good scripturally churches because people that, that, are, that are preaching what you want to, that, that it's what scripture says, people don't want to hear that. So that's why those churches are usually small churches. But at the same time, so that's one thing, you know, so he's speaking great things in that sense. But then he also, 
he blasphemies the Lord. You know, we, we, we see that. I, I saw that, read that there in, in um, Revelation there in 13.1, where it said at the end, upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. You know, that he, you know, he blasphemies the Lord. But the Antichrist will blaspheme God, but will also, as I said, speak things that people want to hear. He will win over people by his words initially. As I mentioned, Hitler did this. Now, I believe the Antichrist will be able to also mesmerize the people with his words so that they will do whatever he wants. And most likely, since the Antichrist is controlled by Satan, then he will also be a man full of knowledge. You know, especially when he really takes over his power. You know, in the first half, he's got power, but I think it's probably more that, you know, these three get plucked more of what, what starts the second half. That's when he really starts gaining control. You know, and that's when he gets indwelt by Satan. And, you know, Satan knows a lot of things. Now, he doesn't know all like God, but he, he's, he's not dumb. He knows a lot of things. You know, he knows all scripture and things like that. So, you know, the man is not, you know, the Antichrist, I don't think he's going to be some unknowledgeable person. There. He's not going to be, um, you know, like when he's illiterate type. He's going to be a smart man in that sense. And obviously, he's not very, very wise, or, you know, for rejecting Jesus. But he's not going to be book-wise or whatever, say knowledge-wise. He's not going to be dumb. And... But as I said, I do believe that, especially speaking, you know, through, uh, you know, the devils we speaking through him. You know, Jesus did that in one sense. He, he, you know, he obviously wasn't using devils, but, you know, because he's God. You know, remember then he was saying things when he was 12 years old. He was there at the temple and, and, and the people were amazed at, you know, the things that he was speaking that, you know, there, it says they were marveled that, that, uh, you know, how does he know all these things and stuff like that? Well, because he's the one that gave the law to Moses. But it's, um, you know, the, the words, you know, he'd have that influence in one sense. And, you know, even today, when you, if, you know, you're given a gospel for people that have the hearts and minds and ears open to hear the word, then it can, it influences them in the way that, uh, you know, it has that power on, you know, the Holy Ghost is working on them. But the Antichrist, you know, I think that's what he'll be doing, just like some of these other people that just their very words. You know, some people, they want to hear everything that this leader has to say. And and they're just they just stand there and all like, wow. I mean, the guy can say anything. I'm coming to come and chop your head off right now. As soon as I get done talking, every one of you in here is going to die. Wow. Yay. You know, I mean, that's just how the people are going to be. But look at verse nine here, Daniel chapter seven, verse nine. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So Daniel suddenly is removed from the four kingdoms or beasts that he saw, and is shown and is shown heaven where he sees the thrones of all of those kingdoms are cast down. You know, so he sees these four kingdoms, and then suddenly he's, he's shown heaven where these four kingdoms are cast down. You know, remember all those other kingdoms were earthly kingdoms that were basically controlled by Satan. You know, they're, war, they're world governments and so forth. Now, Daniel is then shown God to show that it is God who is fully in control of all kingdoms here on earth, including the Antichrist kingdom, which God will one day cast down as well, just as he did with the rest. You know, it may seem like God is not in control at times, but he is always in control. It is just that at times he allows the kingdom to exist for a, while, a time before he destroys it or casts it down. You know, so just like the Babylonian Empire fell, the Medo-Persian Empire fell, and the Greek Empire fell, and Roman Empire collapsed, you know, was gone in the initial phase, now, like I said, the phase two of it's going to come back. It's going to be re revived or whatever, you know, under the Antichrist. But that part two will also fall. You know, when Jesus returns, you know, at the Battle of Armageddon, he's going to return and he's going to destroy the, the Antichrist kingdom. Jesus will be setting up his own kingdom for a thousand years during the millennium. You know, so that kingdom will be destroyed just like all the other ones will be destroyed. You know, that's always... God's kingdoms, you know, he will destroy all of those kingdoms. You know, that, and once Jesus sets up his kingdom and the millennium kingdom, there will never be any other kingdoms again. You know, that just Jesus' kingdom and that's it. Now there is debate over who the Ancient of Days is. You know, it's, notice it says right here, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days 
did sit. So people are like, well, who is this Ancient of Days? You know, some say it refers to God the Father, while many try to say it refers to Jesus Christ. Now, the Ancient of Days clearly is referring to God the Father and not Jesus, as we will see in verse 13, when one like the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. You know, we're not going to get to verse 13, but if you just quickly look here, you know, like I said, it, it cannot be Jesus. People say it is, but it's not. It's clearly God the Father here. So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So, like I said, Jesus is the Son of Man, and so he cannot come before himself, meaning the Ancient of Days, it's God the Father. We know Jesus called himself the Son of Man far more often than he did even the Son of God when he was here on earth. If you read through the New Testament, then oftentimes he'd call himself the Son of Man. So we know that that you know this referring to him, plus it's capitalized. So we know that that this is referring to you know the Son of Man here is Jesus. You can't come before yourself, you know. So he he goes before you know Jesus. Is obedient. You know, remember he said on earth he was always obedient to the Father's will. Whatever you know, whatever he wanted. You know, he came to earth as as the the God Man. You know, because that was the Father's will. You know, he always did what the what the Father wanted. And so, you know, he comes before the Father. <clears throat> but now it says like the Son of Man, because in Daniel's day, then Jesus had not yet come as the Son of Man, but he still looked the same. You know, I believe that's why it says, you know, it says there, um, you know, in verse in verse 13 there, that one like the Son of Man. You know, it doesn't say the Son of Man because he hadn't been, he wasn't the Son of Man yet. He, you know, it still looked the same, but he had not come to earth as the God man. You know, remember, man was made in the image of God. Well, they, because Jesus already looked like what we would say is a man today. You know, he didn't become all of a sudden look like a man once he became the God man. He already looked. That's what he looks like. You know, he always looked. That's why they were made in God's image. That, that, that man was made in God's image. That is man looks like him, not Jesus looks like a man. Now, Jesus came as a man, but, you know, he, he didn't all, you know, all of a sudden, you, you know, look that way. So he always looked that way, but he was not the son of man yet because he had not come down as earth as the god man so you know he looked like him but he wasn't the son of man yet you know it's kind of like looking into the future is what daniel was seeing here um, now god the father as the ancient of days it's described as having hair like wool now wool is white and white hair is said to be a sign of wisdom you know, if you if you look in uh, scripture, I didn't look it up, but you know, it mentions that you know that the white hair is a uh, sign of wisdom. Now, his garment is also described as being white as snow. White represents purity, and nothing is more pure than God. You know, when you think of you know white fresh snow, when you when snow first comes down, it's very very white. You know, the sun really reflects off it brightly and so forth. Just as uh, Jesus is, is, you know, represented, remember, the sun is a type of Jesus. And he, you know, shines forth. Well, that's kind of what the snow does. But it's it's super white, you know, when it first falls. You know, somebody that's never seen snow or something. Now, it doesn't take long. It gets kind of dirtyish from just everything around. But when it's first fresh, it's very white. You know, it's pure white. And, and clean wool... Uh, you know, same way, like on a newborn lamb or whatever. And it said white represents purity. That's why, theoretically, you know, brides wear white. You know, the, the, the church, the bride is described as wearing white. And unfortunately, most of them are not pure today, but that's what the white represents. So we see, you know, we see he's the ancient of days because God the Father has always existed. He's never, you know, he's the one that created time and so forth like that. So, you know, he created everything. Now, his, his throne is described as being like a fiery flame. 
and his wheels as a burning fire. Now notice God the Father is sitting on his throne because his work is done. You know, when you when you sit, you're done. You know, that's why it says later on, it says in Hebrews a bunch of places, that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. Now the right hand is the is the side of power, and so that's why he's on the right side. But he's also seated because his work is done. You know, it, it tells us in Hebrews that he came once to earth to die, died once for our sins, and it was done. He was completed. You know, unlike Roman Catholics, you want to crucify him over and over multiple times in a day, you know, through the Eucharist. And, you know, when you're, when you're done, you come home from work or whatever, you've been out working in the yard, you're done, you come in, you sit down, you're done. And, um, you know, so, you know, shows that, you know, his, his work is done. You know, he sent Jesus to die for us. He sent his son to die for us. So things were done. You know, there's still stuff going on, but it's, it's completed. Satan's already defeated and he knows it. And that's why he's going to try to take as many with him during the tribulation and so forth as he can. But he knows he's already defeated. So, but like I said, we see his, his throne being described as this fiery flame and the wheels as a burning fire. And there's other places in Scripture that talk about how Jesus rides on cherubim and other places like clouds. But, you know, it talks about riding on, on, on cherubim. Well, then you look in like Ezekiel where it talks about the cherubim. You know, it talks about these creatures with these wheels and on the fire and so forth like that. So, um, you know, we kind of see all that connection. But we'll go ahead and pick it up next week in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. We'll look at, at uh, chapter, uh, verse 10, and um, we'll pick it up from there. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us here to once again worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus, what he did for us on Calvary. We pray that you'll continue to bless the rest of the, the day, the rest of the week, and allow a safe return for Sunday. We just pray, Lord, that you'll intervene in the situations that, that need to be done, that bring justice where wrong has been done. Put your healing touch where it needs to be placed upon those out there that are that are making a stand for you, Lord. And we just pray for all those that have been affected by the hurricane down there on the uh, Florida and South Carolina and other places. And, and um, Father, just be with all those that... that um, that need you convict the people of their sins that today might be the day that many get saved. And we just ask all these things in Jesus name. Amen.